this was all circulating around the base that a giant had been killed, but no one was supposed to talk about it. I saw three long bony fingers reach up underneath the door, curl up to grab it, and then disappear. When he came over to me, dude, he slithered over to me. And this giant comes out of the cave and they're all frozen. And he starts running and firing at this giant. Well, the giant moves. He's got a spear in one hand and he's running really fast and spears Dan and holds him up like this. Somebody yells, shoot him in the face, shoot him in the face. They basically decapitate him. Got closer, got closer, got closer. When he got about 15 yards away from me, I raised that 12 gauge and I blow his head off. I feel something pulling at my leg. And I look over and there are two small gray entities pulling at me. And they're literally, I'm getting pulled off the bed. I reached my hand into this bush and I touch air. Couldn't breathe and I couldn't move because I know I'm seeing a monster. Yep. Welcome to the show, everybody. You're listening to The Confessionals. I am your host, Tony Merkel. Thank you for being here. If you've had an encounter or a story you'd like to share with me on the show, go ahead and shoot me an email. My email address is theconfessionals at theconfessionalspodcast.com. That's theconfessionals at theconfessionalspodcast.com. Or go to the website, theconfessionalspodcast.com. Hit the contact section and you can reach me that way as well. Either way works for me, just get a hold of me. And if you want more shows every week, go to theconfessionalspodcast.com. Hit the join button and become a member today because we give an extra show every Thursday on the website for members. So if you want more of what we do, just go to theconfessionalspodcast.com, hit that join button and become that member. Now, this week we have a fantastic show. I've been wanting to put this show out for a while and we finally are here. But before we get into this week's show, I want to let you guys know that we do have that Discord and I know many people were saying the link wasn't working. I fixed the link. So the link that's in the description of this episode is working just fine. You can join the Discord and please go ahead and follow us on YouTube. Subscribe to The Confessionals on YouTube. The link is in the description because once that channel hits 25,000 subscribers, I'm going to start releasing my journeys. You might be saying, what journeys are you talking about? I'm starting a new video series on YouTube called Chasing Legends, where I go out and I look for lost treasures, ghost towns, monsters of the woods, aliens, UFOs, all the legends that we hear about on this show. I'm actually going to go out now and hunt for these legends. I spent four to five years listening to these legendary stories, and it's now time for Tony Merkel to go out and look and find these legends himself. And that's what I'm doing, but I'm not releasing any of the videos until we hit at least 25,000 subscribers. Once we hit 25,000 subscribers on the YouTube channel, I will release the very first expedition where we went looking for reptilians. But what we found instead was much more interesting to me, historic actually, here in Pennsylvania. And I'm looking forward to sharing that little journey with you guys. And there will be many more to come. In fact, today we have Kyle coming on the show and Kyle's in Kentucky. And this is going to be an overtime show. He's down in Kentucky and he has had the most dramatic dog man encounter I have ever heard my entire life. And he's going to go into it for many, many hours with me. This is a whole week of Kyle. We got today's show. We have the overtime right after this show on the website for members. And then on Thursday, we're going to have more of Kyle's experiences with just the weirdness in Kentucky. That's what we're going to cover on Thursday. But this is so dramatic that I asked Kyle if I could come down to visit him in Kentucky. And he said, yes, he will take me to the location where he had this crazy, wild experience. He told me that he will not stay out there overnight. He said, I can if I want to, but he will not do it. Well, I'm down there to film Chasing Legends, so what do you think I'm going to do? I'm going to be out there overnight 
unless I get too scared, then maybe I won't be. We'll find out. But I'm going down in October to do filming for that show in Kentucky. Now, let's get to Kyle right after I play a short little trailer teaser of my journey in Pennsylvania. Just one of the things we uncovered while we were out there looking for the reptilians. We're going to play this trailer and make sure that you go to the YouTube channel and hit subscribe. And while you're there, watch the trailer that you're about to hear right now. If you want to look at it, there's like a religious significance to this as well. Uh, I wouldn't say people should come here for pilgrimages, but they say that these rocks, which were all underwater at one time, uh, came up from underneath the water when the continents shifted. And they reference how the continents shift. Some people talk about how it was a great flood that shifted the continents. And so if the continents did shift from a great flood, and this whole rock formation was a like a riverbed or, or an ocean bed that got turned sideways through the tectonic plate shifting and pushed up, then we literally might be touching and standing next to something that literally was a result of the great flood in the Bible, which is really cool to think about. Today we got a good show planned for you guys. Uh, this is one of those shows where I've been waiting a while to do. Uh, Kyle, how you doing, sir? I'm doing good. How are you? Doing fine, man. I just want to fill the audience in a little bit of you know how this all came about because uh, Kyle, I get I get a lot of emails from people about their experiences, and I absolutely love the emails. Keep them coming. But your email, one, I don't get a ton of dogman encounter stories, and when I do, it stands out to me because it's a topic that I don't get to talk about a whole lot and I'm always excited to do so. And the way you wrote your email, it was so captivating. I mean, I'm not even kidding you, man. I'm sitting in my office chair reading emails and I find myself getting closer and closer and closer to my computer screen as I'm reading it because I was just like, what's going to happen next? Oh my gosh, what's going to happen next? And uh, after I got done reading it, I, I was thinking, I'm going to like, I'm going to text this guy. I got to get him on the show. And you were one of the first pre people in such a long time that didn't leave their phone number with the email. It's like, no way. It's like, so I emailed you back, but it's like, you know, who knows if you're ever going to check your email. Some people don't check the emails. Sometimes they, they forget about it or whatever. I was like, oh man. And it was a couple of weeks. And then you finally contacted me back. I think you text me and I was just so happy you got a hold of me. So thanks for being here, man. Yeah. I'm glad I finally got to touch base with you and get on the same track. Yeah, for sure. Because uh, I'm not even kidding you. There's probably not a day that went by that I didn't think about that email. I was thinking, man, I hope I hear from this guy. <laughs> so uh, just to fill the, the audience in here a little bit, uh, you're in Kentucky and we're going to do... Um, this is going to be an overtime show because you got a lot of stuff you want to share with people. And this first segment, we're going to really focus in on your personal experiences here for the first hour. Uh, we're going to start off with your initiation experience, which is probably the most dramatic experience you've ever had in your life with anything. And uh, then we're going to also be talking about uh, your your dad's experiences, your grandfather's experiences, other relatives like your uncle. And we're going to talk about the area of Kentucky and all the strangeness in the area. Uh, you have a lot of information to share with people. And I'm just really excited about because that's what this show is about. It's about telling stories, but also if people can, when they come on, you know, fill in the people in as to, especially with your kind of situation, what what is the area like in Kentucky? Because right now I had said to you earlier about how Kentucky's really being focused on a lot in the paranormal commu community with the Hellier uh, web series. And it, it's just like, it's really like I mentioned to you earlier before about Somerset and you were kind of shocked by that. But uh, there's a lot of people around the country, around the world that are really looking at Kentucky right now saying, what is up with Kentucky? And you're going to be able to provide some more information as to the strangeness the very strangeness of Kentucky. So I'm going to hand it over to you, sir. If you could just start walking us through, you know, your first experience, what were you doing? What were you doing out there? And just take it away, sir. 
Okay. Well, um, I grew up in the foothills of Eastern Kentucky in the base of Appalachian Mountains and uh, spent the majority of my ch- childhood um, in the Daniel Boone National Forest. And uh, as you said before, this area is known for a lot of strange occurrences, uh, especially the area I live in. And uh, it's, I'm, it's a very rural, rural area. And um, like um, I live out in the sticks. I'm not close to any cities. You have to go a couple counties over and either you work in the coal mines or 45 minutes an hour, maybe two hours, go to a big city and work in a factory somewhere if you don't go to the military or to college. And um, I grew up hunting and fishing. You know, that's that's what I was taught to do. That's what I enjoy doing as a child. I spent the majority of my childhood with my grandfather who, you know, uh, around here we call him Mama and Papa instead of Grandma and Grandpa. And uh, he taught me the base of my upbringing. You know, I'm, I'm a Christian. I was raised in a Pentecostal family. And uh, I still have strong beliefs in Christianity. I'm not as close to God today as I probably should be, but that's that's the base of my upbringing. Um, I grew up in the mountains. Uh, doing some substance living, um, hunting, fishing, as I said before, also a fur bearer, um, small game, trapping, hunting with dogs. Um, My first encounter was actually hunting with dogs. And the reason why I feel compelled to tell my story is to give tribute to my dogs. And I'm a houndsman. You know, we we uh, we raised different breeds. Um, we had black and tans, walkers, red ticks, red bones, blue tick, English, mountain cur, and even some feist, which that's a smaller breed of uh, hound. And we use those those hounds for squirrel hunting, for rabbit hunting, and for uh, raccoon hunting. Uh, my story actually takes place in the Daniel Boone National Forest, coon hunting. And for those that don't know what coon hunting is, that's raccoon hunting. And it's where you take these hounds, as I said before, and you train them from pups. You train them with, we always trained ours with old, older dogs. You turn them loose and, and they walk around in the Daniel Boone or the forest, wherever. And they, they, they're looking for the scent of raccoon. And once they find the scent of the raccoon, they start trailing the raccoon when i say trailing you know they're using their nose and they're following the path that that the raccoon has previously traveled and as they they follow the the path they let out location barks letting you know hey i'm i found the scent and i'm currently tracking it that's what they're telling the the hunter their 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 master and as they track them the raccoon will most of the time climb a tree someplace after they get tired of running and once they climb the tree someplace, the dog does what's called treeing. They go to the tree that the raccoon climbed up, and they start barking up the tree in that same exact location and not moving where they're at. They just continue to bark in the spot, letting their, their masters know, hey, we found it. And they stay in that location until the, the handler or the master walks in at night because raccoons are nocturnal. They shine the the tree that raccoons in with a, with a light and they shoot the raccoon out and the dog gets it and brings it to you. And then, you know, that's for, we do that for population control because raccoons can carry and transmit more types of, of diseases than, than most rodent animals in our area, including rabies. And if you get rabies, it's uncurable to this day. If you get rabies, you'll have to take a shot until the day that you die. So it's for population control. And we were fur bearers. So once we get these raccoons, we would tan their hide, you know, skin them, flesh them, tan their hides, and and sell their hides. That's just part of my upbringing. That's how I was raised. That's an extra side hustle that we had to, to, to make money. And... 
you can argue whether it's humane or not, but it, I mean, it is population control and, and it's an important part of maintaining a healthy habitat in the national forest. With that being said, let's get into my, my encounter. My encounter happened October 1st, 2003. It was the opening night of coon hunting season in, in the state of Kentucky. Me and my grandfather were, were going to go that night. And my grandfather was in poor health. He had heart conditions. He had a heart disease. So he was unable to, to handle these dogs. I always handled the dogs for him. I went and got the dogs and put the dogs in the dog box, loaded them up, turned them loose, went back and got them where they're in the forest, put them on a dog leash, brought them back, put them in the dog box, took care of them. Every one of our dogs were trained with love. We never beat on them or abused them or anything like that. We trained them with love. They were just as much as part of our family as a, a brother, sister, cousin, uncle, you know. And um, as my grandfather called me up and asked him to go hunt with him that night, my mother dro drove me over and drop, dropped me off on my grandfather's property. And he told me to go get the dogs. The very first dog that I went and got was our young dog. His name was Bo. He was a red tick breed. He was almost solid red almost he had a few white specks on him kind of like color like a strawberry wine yeah, beautiful in every way and then i went and loaded him up in the dog box by myself as my grandfather waited i went back over to where we keep our dogs at to the kennels and i grabbed hold of our old dog i hooked him on a dog leash and brought him over to load him up when i say old i mean that was our trained dog our mature dog and he, his name was old Jake. He was a walker. That was his breed. He was a tricolor dog. I mean, he's three different colors, white, black, and tan. He had a white chest, white face, white belly, and had some black and tricolor, you know, black and some tan spots on his back. And oh, and he's a heck of a dog, experienced, an excellent dog, had a heck of a nose on him. He could smell a raccoon that had went through a ditch someplace out in the woods anywhere from five minutes ago to two or three hours. He was an excellent dog, perfect in every way. He was a giant of a dog for his breed. You know, for, for his breed, dogs usually weigh between 70 to maybe 80 pounds of upper 80s, but he was 120 pounds, hoss, a giant of a dog for his breed. He was an excellent kill dog. Whenever I say kill dog, I mean, sometimes whenever you go raccoon hunting and you shoot a raccoon out of a tree, they don't always come out dead. Sometimes the dog has to dispose of the animal. He was really good at that. He's quick and to the point. He would do it humanely as a dog possibly could. And he had several encounters where uh, coyotes would come into him whenever he was treeing and he would fight coyotes on the tree because whenever old Jake got treed in his mind, that was his domain and anything at all that ever came in there, he would fight tooth and nail to hold the tree that he was on because in his mind, he wasn't about to give up that tree to anything because he put in all this hard work and effort to track this raccoon. And as I said, there's coyotes that came in on him and he fought on the tree and, and killed these coyotes. You know, that was, that's just part of, that's part of nature and it's part of hunting that sometimes unexpected things happen. And on this night, October 1st, 2003, we got a little bit of a late start than what we normally do. So back then there were a lot more coon hunters. And they were already out and about. And we, we went to the Daniel Boone National Forest because that's that's where we I grew up hunting. And that's that's where we always went. You know, that's the only area that we ever really hunted. And so we went on a six mile road, gravel road that leads you into the Daniel Boone out into the middle of the Daniel Boone National Forest. And normally we wouldn't have went in there that far. But because we got a late start. There were already hunters out that night, and we were hunting night because raccoons are nocturnal. And so we took this six-mile road all the way to the very, very end. 
there's no no houses, no markets, no lights. It's just Mother Nature, you, your dogs, your vehicle. And as we got out there to the very end of the road, it's pitch black dark. We're next to a cliff. My my grandfather stopped the truck. He told me to get out and turn the dogs loose. So I get out, I drop the tailgate down, open up the dog box, turn the dogs loose. Old Jake and Bo, they started over this holler that's right right off next to the road. It wasn't very long at all before they picked up a scent track of a raccoon. They start following the raccoon and barking, and they're they're doing a great job on this track, track job. And Bo's walking right along with him. He's coming along pretty good in his training. He's a young dog, but he's fully grown. He's maturing properly. And they do a heck of a job on it. The uh, the raccoon track crosses the road in front of us. And it goes up on the side of a mountain. The dogs follow it on top of a cliff. And over the back side of the cliff. A good 700 yards away or so. And then old Jake lets off a location bark, letting us know, hey, I found where the raccoon's at. And Bo's walking right along with him, doing doing a pretty good job, you know. Then a few moments later, my, my grandfather says, hey, you know, they found it. You better get the rifle and head on in there. You know, shoot the raccoon out and bring the dogs back. So I said, all right, Papa, you know, I'm 15 years old. I grab the gun out of the back of the truck. It's a 22 long, long shot and strap it on my back with my back strap. I take my hunting light. We hunted with uh, these big night lights that let off tremendous light. And almost makes it look like daylight wherever you're walking at because you're shining up. You're shining these trees that are 100 foot tall sometimes. So you have to have a really good light. And I take a two-way radio with me, and my papa has a two-way radio with him. He sits at the truck because, as I said, he was in poor health and wasn't able to walk far distances. And this is part of my upbringing, you know, so it's it's all natural to me. And I wouldn't trade it for anything, you know. And I start walking in there towards the dogs where they're barking at. And I'm doing radio checks with my papa and stuff. We're checking with one another, making sure. We can hear each other and stuff. And then as I'm walking in there and the and old Jake and Bo's in their tree, I hear a pack of coyotes open up in the distance. Pretty good ways off. Pretty good sized pack of coyotes. I don't know, seven or eight maybe. But I mean it's it's a bigger pack than anything that, that we've ever dealt with. And my papa calls me on the radio and says, Hey, you hear that pack of coyotes in there? I said, Yeah, Papa, I hear them in there. He said, well, you better make your way on in there to them, Jake and Bo. That way, if coyotes come around, they'll they'll run off because they're they're terrified of people here in Kentucky because they've they've always been hunted hard. There's open season on them because they're they're a pest animal. So you're I mean open season I mean that you you're allowed to, to kill them on sight anytime. So they're terrified of people. Even at night, if you if you walk up on one, you shine a flashlight on one. That coyote is going to run with everything it has in it to get away from you. That's just how it is. And any hunters out there can probably contest to this. I'm sure they're probably just as terrified across the United States and in all other locations as they are in Kentucky. But so I start, you know, I pick up my pace a little bit, not not rushing myself because I have to walk up a mountain and then on top of a cliff and on the back side of the cliff. So it's a good 700 yards away. And, you know, the coyotes in the distance, they stop, they stop barking. And uh, Jay can boast that they're still treed in there, still, you know, just like nothing's wrong. And then a little bit later on, the pack of coyotes start yipping and hollering and barking again. Except this time they're closer. So, so they're moving towards Jake and Bo because. In their mind, they hear Jake and Bo in their tree, and they think, "Hey, this is a this is our meal ticket. That there's an animal over here barking, letting us know where he's at. We're gonna go in here and eat it." That that's essentially what this pack of coyotes was going to do. And once again, my grandfather calls me and says, "Hey, you know, 
the pack's getting closer. You need to get in there a little bit, a little bit faster. Let me know, hey, pick up your pace, get in there to the dogs. That way, we know our dogs are safe. And I, I'll let you know, hey, okay, I'm heading that way. I'm going to do exactly what you say. So I start picking up my pace even faster. And then it wasn't very long after that that the pack of coyotes make it to the tree that old Jake and Bo was treeing on. And sure enough, the fight breaks out. You can hear it all plain as day. The fight breaks out. You can hear this pack of coyotes, you know, fighting with our dogs. And they must have grabbed a hold of Bo pretty good because he starts squealing, you know, like letting off his little pup squeal. And you can hear him just barking and squealing through the country, just getting with it like the devil's chasing him, just getting out of Dodge while, while this pack of coyotes are, you know, following him. But not old Jake. Old Jake stays right there on the tree. And he'd come off and grab hold of them coyotes. And whenever he did, you'd hear them coyotes letting off death screams, you know, going on crazy because he had jaws like a pit bull. When he locked down on them, they felt it. He was a kill dog. And he'd come off the tree and fight with those coyotes. And then they'd cower away from him. And whenever they cower away from him, he go right back on the tree and start training just like he wasn't in there, just yo, 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 just chop, chopping the tree down with his barks. At least that's what he thought he was doing. Because in his mind, he's a big man on campus, and he done all that work to track that raccoon, and he'd be damned before he'd let a pack of coyotes come in and take that tree away from him. And then once again, the dynamic of the fight had changed, and these coyotes had finally mustered up the courage to go in on old Jake as a pack, not one by one as they were doing before. And once they'd they'd done that, they actually started hurting him. And you could hear him whimpering. And and my my grandfather called me. He's like, listen, they're going to kill him. you got to get there. And so I'm just a few yards from him, Not, not really far, but still he's out of my sight. And just a few moments after that, it's like, it's like Bo came back. And once again, the dynamic of the, of the fight changed. And you can hear old Jake really putting a hurting on these coyotes. They're squealing, squalling. He's locking down on them. It's just a crazy battle in the, in the middle of the woods. And so I make my way in there. I'm not far from him. And I see him. With my light, I shine my light on him. And whenever I shine my light on him, he has a coat by the throat. And in that moment that I shine my light on him, I blind him a little bit. He lets go of the coat. The coat takes off running. And you can see the pack start to scatter and run away from me, you know, because they're scared of humans. And I walk over to Jake and I bend down and pet him and stuff. And he's holding his pile up. He's hurt, but he ain't, he ain't in too bad a shape because he's, he's a tough dog and can take on a lot. He's real muscular and really great shape. You know, I pet him and stuff, and he follows along behind me. And behind this great big black oak tree, huge black oak tree, I hear a coat on the other side of it doing what I call a, a blood gargle. You know, it's choking on its own blood. And for just a brief moment, I'm a little bit tickled inside thinking, you know, Bo came back and he's around this, he's around this side of this oak tree and he's got one of these coats and he come back and help, I help old Jake out, you know, helped him in the fight. And so I don't think nothing about it. And I walk around this big black oak tree. I shine my light. And whenever I shine my light, that's whenever I notice it wasn't Bo. It wasn't Bo at all. It's this great big dog. When I say big, I mean, it's the big as a St. Bernard, real wide, huge dog. I mean, it's huge. And it's, it's a strange dog, you know, so I'm stopping. I stop and I shine my light. It's clear as day because my light's really bright. I shine my light on it and, and it's, it has this coat by the chest, 40, 50 pound coat. He's holding it by the chest in its mouth. I say he or she, but I don't really know if it was a he or she. 
but it's holding it by the chest and there's not a piece of this 40, 50 pound coyote's body that's touching the ground. That's how big this dog is. And I'm just standing there looking because, you know, it's this strange dog. Like, I, I, I don't know this dog. I've never seen it. It's odd looking dog. And it notices me. And whenever it, it notices me, it drops that coat out of its mouth. Just drops it down. Let's go of it. And then it's, it almost leans forward and kind of looks like a, an old man standing up out of, a, out of a rocking chair, a cracker barrel somewhere on the porch. Real slow. I don't hear any bones pop. Or nothing like that. It just, it almost leans in forward, facing me. And it's standing up on its back legs. And it's, it's towering over me. You know, I'm 5'10". And it's uh, at least two foot taller than I am. And in my mind, I'm thinking, there ain't no way in the world that this, this thing's standing up. It's, it's, it's got to be leaning against something because... It, it can't be standing up, you know, and then it takes two steps forward. And whenever it takes that two steps forward, I get a, a good look at it. I get a look at its chest. It had a the abdomen, almost like a man it had blood dripping, coating it, running down its chest like a hot hot candle wax dripping off a wick just fresh and then i see it pulls pulls its hands up to its side and when i say hands i mean hands it didn't have paws it had hands like that of a man but more claw like i guess you could say and and then it's it's charcoal color not black but like a burnt charcoal that you've been cooking with on a grill you know just a almost a gray but black and had pitch black eyes a darkness eternal black hole didn't have no light no light reflecting off of it it's just pitch black and i'm i'm looking at this thing thinking to myself this is a damn werewolf like th there's no way this isn't supposed to supposed to exist. You know, it's not. I'm looking at something that's not from this world. And it takes another step forward towards me. We're just a few feet apart. And that's when it hits me. This thing is from hell and I have got to get out of here. I turn around to start running. And it. it starts running after me towards me i probably didn't make it 10 steps before old jake hits into him when i say he hits into him i mean he lunges his chest and his body weight and starts to snapping at this monster starts to snapping at him and whenever i hear his body weight hitting that thud hitting i'm shining a lot forward and shining my lot back the whole time you know i'm concerned about old jake and my light's bright enough where I can see everything that's going on behind me whenever I take those moments. And as sure as the world, that thing takes one hand and just pushes old Jack back, rolls him away like a fly or flea, like he was just a gnat, like, like he was nothing. Four or five foot, just away like he was just nothing. Like it didn't even bother him at all. This thing was just so much bigger. And then after it does that, it continues to pursue me, coming straight on after me. And a little bit later, I start yelling, come on, old Jake, put it to him. Come on, boy, you can do it. Come on. I need you. Come on. And then he hits into him again. Old Jake hits into him again, throwing his body weight, lunging his body weight. Because I have his gun strapped to my back. I, I didn't have, have the knowledge at that point in time in my life to deal with something like that. The world threw something at me that I was unprepared to deal with. And that gun was not going to do me a lick of good. Not on this thing, it wasn't. And then old Jake hits him again. 
throwing that same body weight into him, snapping at him, trying to slow this monster down to to stop it from pursuing me. Because whether I was calling for him to do it or not, old Jake was going to do it anyway because he felt like I was I was in danger. And once again, that thing just throws him away again like he was just nothing. And he just rolls, rolls, rolls over, rolls him over like he, like he was nothing. I mean, oh, Jake's a 120-pound dog. He ain't no little fella. It rolls him right way four or five foot. And then it continues to run on after me. And I start yelling again, come on, old Jake, get him. Put it to him. Come on. I need you. Come on. Put it to him. Put it to him, old Jake. Get him. And then, I'm, as I said, I'm shining my light. Then I hear this this pop, and I hear old Jake's jaws locked down. And whenever I heard his jaws locked down that time, I knew that he got him. And I shine my light back, and old Jake's hanging on this dog man's hip, just, just hanging there on the side of his hip like a chihuahua on a mailman. That's that's the size difference. There's, he was just nowhere near as big as this thing was. And as sure as I'm telling you today, it stopped and grabbed a hold of old Jake with both hands and threw him through the woods like he was a bag of trash, like he was nothing. I mean, threw him through the woods. And I seen his body flying, hitting low hanging tree branches and limbs and and debris in the woods. And that's it. That's it. I, I, that's when I realized that's it. He killed my dog. This dog man has killed my dog. It's just me and the monster. I ain't got nobody in the world that could save me because there's no way that he's alive after that. There, there's just no way. And then it continues to run on after me. I shine my light for it, and I'm still screaming, come on, old Jake, come on, I need you. Put it to him, boy, put it to him, I need you. And he ain't coming. He ain't coming at all. It's just me and the me and this hellhound. It's just staying right on after me like a rabbit on a dog track, just every step. And it's gaining ground on me. I mean, it's right on me. I was so so nervous and so tore all to pieces in my mind, scared to death. I'm getting chased by something out of a movie is what it looks like. And Daniel Boone himself couldn't come up from the grave and help me. I mean, it's, it's right on me. He's blowing his breath on the back of my neck. That hot breath, it's, it's going right around my side of my cheek that breath didn't smell like rot it smelled like if you've ever walked up on a buzzard's roost or a, a vulture's uh roost in the middle of the woods while you're hiking or hunting or something like that and that the puke and vomit that they that they spit out smells like distinct and unique unlike anything i've ever smelled before and as i'm running and I'm tore all to pieces and I'm shattered in a million pieces in my mind. I trip and fall over a tree root or branch or something into uh, a treetop that had blown over. Maybe lightning hit it or it fell over naturally. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure, but I fall into it. It looked like maybe an oak and I fall, I fall on my belly face first and I roll over on my back and I'm trying to push my way backwards through all this bramble that I've, I've got myself caught in. And by that time, this dog man drops down on all fours. And it's, I mean, we're face to face. We couldn't have been more than maybe two foot from each other. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at straight in his face and it's snapping them jaws and that blood, blowing that blood and snot on me. And blood's still dripping off of it fresh. And it's got its mouth open, and I can see down the back of its throat. I can see its teeth, its jawline, its mouth, everything. And I mean, I'm 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 shook to the core. I mean, this is horrible, horrible sight that I'm seeing, and I'm still screaming, "Come on, OJ! Come on! I need you! Come on! Where you at? Come on! I need you! Help me! Help me! Come on!" Because that's the that's the only thing I could think to do. You know, and I, I still got that gun strapped to my back, but I'm just, my mind's just not there to use that gun. And it wasn't going to do me no good anyways. And all of a sudden, as sure as I'm telling you this today, that thing was on all fours coming in at me, that mouth was snapping, snarling. 
out of nowhere like a hammerhead shark. OJ hits him broadside. Whenever he hits him broadside, he climbs up on top of him. That thing rolls over on his back. He just starts munching on him, just mauling him, just munching on him. And about that time of year, a bones crush. And and Jake got him good somewhere. I I, I don't know where he, where he got him at. I, I, I tend to think now, looking back on it, maybe he, he got him on the hands or, and broke some bones in his hands or something. I'm not, I don't know where he got him. But when I heard them bones break and that sucker let off a howl that rumbled me. I mean, it rattled me. I could feel it in my chest. It felt like the very earth around me was a shaking. And that's when it hit me. This is my chance. And I stood up, climbed up out of that treetop, and just took off getting it back to the truck as fast as I can go. And I made it down not very far from the truck where my papa was waiting at. And, and I started yelling, come on, old Jake, come on. And then that the fight had changed, and that thing had got a hold of old Jake and was a killing him. I mean, absolutely killing him. You could hear him. Him squalling. I mean, it's unlike, I don't know if anyone's ever heard the sound of a big dog in the woods getting, getting mauled or attacked by a dog man or, you know, a panther or, or anything, bear. It was just, it turns your guts. It just pulls your guts out and makes you feel just sick of hearing your, your, the animal that you loved getting mutilated because that's what was happening. And I took the gun off my back and I held it up in the air and fired it, not towards the direction of, of old Jake, but up towards the cliffs. You know, this was a semi-automatic 22. Just pow, 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 pow. Every shot that I had in that gun, yelling, come on, come on, old Jake, come on. I need you. Come on, let's go home. Come on, come on. I'm crying. Got tears rolling down my face, sweat, dirt everything else and everything just went silent there wasn't the sound of crickets no frogs no night birds off chirping nothing it was just silence i mean there i didn't smell nothing i didn't see nothing i was just tore all to pieces you know i was shattered and broken and then i turned around ran on down to the truck i opened up the door sat inside my papa looked at me and said, what in the world is going on? And I told him, I said, papa, we got to go. We got to get out of here right now. There's a monster in the woods. We have got to go now. Turn the key on and go. And I started explaining to him everything I could down to the last detail. And as he turned that truck on and he said, all right, yeah, I see you tore all the pieces. We'll, we'll head on out of here. And as I was telling him, he said, I'll take you home. He said, but listen, if what you told me is true, then we have to come back and get Jake. We have to. And I told my papa, I said, listen, you, you know, it, there's no point. He, he's, he's gone. He's dead. I mean, he, there's no way he lived. He went on to be with Jesus. You know, he's gone. And my papa took his jacket out off and opened up the door and threw his jacket out. Because there were several other times in the past where Jake didn't come back in when we were on big coon hunting trips and stuff. And he'd find that scene of my papa's jacket and he'd lay there on that jacket till the next day we come pick him up. Because, you know, in the deep Daniel Boone National Forest, it's, it's thick, thick country. And it's, it's not always that the dogs can make it back out. We didn't have no big fancy tracking systems or nothing like that, you know. And my papa said, listen, if if what you said is true, then we owe it to him. And I started thinking about it, you know. I mean, even though I was, I mean, I was a glass case of emotion. I was shattered in, in every way of, uh, that a man can, can possibly be shattered. I mean, I, it's hard for me to tell the story right now, just reliving it. But he said, you owe it to him to come back. My papa, with knowledge well beyond my years, was right. 
And he said, he fought for your life four times. Four times he fought for your life. He did it out of love for you. We have got to come back and look for him. I said, well, all right, Papa, you know, at that age, what my upbringing stuff, what my Papa said was a law anyway. And what he said went, no matter what I said or how I tried to argue it, I didn't want to go back in them woods. There wasn't nothing in the world that would made me want to go back. But my upbringing, there was no back talking or saying, no, I'm not going to do it. You had to do it. It's just part of it. And on the ride home, my papa explained to me, he said, listen, now, there's things in these woods that I cannot explain. I've hunted these woods my whole entire life. But if you want to hunt and you want to fish and dig ginseng and look for mushrooms and do man stuff, you've got to come to terms with it. If you want to do what you love, you have to come to terms with it. And that was that was knowledge that I, I mean, well beyond my years. I, I, I life threw something at me on that night that I was not ready and equipped to deal with. And most men to this day would not be equipped to deal with it because it wasn't supposed to be real. It wasn't supposed to exist. But I know today that it bleeds just like anything else. And that it did exist, and it's tangible. It's real. I, I say, I mean, it's real. I know that it's real. So, we went on back to the farm. I didn't get hardly any sleep that night. I tried my best. You know, I got what sleep I could. And the sun came up that next morning. You know, my papa woke me up. He said, "All right, let's go back out there." And we drove down that road. You know, Bo never did come back either. We drove way on down that road. We'd stop, and I would never get out of the truck. I'd roll the window down. My papa would get out of the truck. He'd walk up to the front of the truck and around the back of the truck, and he'd yell, come on. Come on, old Jake, come on. Let's go home. Come on. And he'd whistle and stuff. And then I'd, I'd yell out the window, come on, old Jake, come on. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. He never came on. He never did. And then... You know, we done that for a couple of hours and we went back home, back out to the farm. And my papa told me, he said, we'll, we'll go back out this evening, look again. We we went back out that evening, done the same exact thing. We'd stop and roll down the windows and get out of the truck and yell and whistle and try to get him to come on in. Nothing was moving. We never seen no dog man or nothing else moving. I mean, there was just nothing moving. We drove on down to his jacket that he threw out, and we yelled and tried to get him call, call him to come in. He never came in. And that evening, after we tried a few times, my papa yelled and said, Hey, listen, there's, there's something coming through the woods here. And I was listening, you know, looking. And on down the road real slow, there's something moving in the woods. We come out to the we come out to the gravel road. My papa said, "Hey, uh, Bo, Bo's down there in the road. That big red tick dog, of yours. Go get in the back of the truck and get your dog leash and go down there and get him." I said, "All right, papa," because you know, like I said, that was law. I went and got my dog leash out of the back of the truck. Started walking down the road to him, and he's walking real slow. Whenever I got up close to him, I noticed that that he wasn't Bo. It was, it was old Jake, and he's covered head to toe in blood. It just it's matted in him. He's moving real slow. His back, right hips fractured. He's walking with a severe limp. He's got big gash marks down the back of his hips. His nose is just about setting sideways on his face, barely hanging on. His, his chest is ripped open. You could see his chest plate there in the front. Both of his ears look like freshly cooked ramen noodles on both sides, just just meat hanging, you know. It just looked like a meat sack, you know. It's just, he's mangled, mutilated, just barely hanging on to life. There wasn't much life in him. 
you know, and he's, but he's alive. And I, I, I yelled at my papa. I said, Papa, it's old Jake. And Papa walked over to him, and he was always a tough love type of type of man, you know. Yeah, that's just how he was. He's a tough love type of man. He had a bad heart and everything. But to this day, I never seen him do what he done that day. He bent over and picked up all 120 pounds of old Jake's body, walked over to the back of the truck, and he didn't put him in the dog box. He just laid him down real slow on the back of the truck. And I mean, he's hanging on to life. And I mean, his collar was gone. Uh, and his, his tail, most of his tail had been ripped off. There wasn't much of his tail left. And we drove back up to the farm. And whenever we drove up to the farm, my pal packed old Jake in the house, you know. And I believe most people at this time probably would have, would have probably drove him home and loaded up a gun, probably put a bullet in his head and put him out of his misery, you know, because he's suffering. But we didn't. My mamma done a lot of veterinarian work on the farm and stuff with all of her animals. And she kept him in the house there for three weeks and she doctored him back to life, back to health. And he lived. I mean, yeah, he's mutilated and stuff, but he lived. We had a lot of kinfolk family and stuff come up and see him see him how bad of a shape he was in he's tore up but i mean she she doctored him up and brought him back to life we gave him uh we gave him he drank gatorade and stuff like that you know i mean whatever whatever remedy that that she could come up with you know she glued his ears back everything she could do and he actually ended up surviving making it through it i mean, there was no reason at all that he should have lived. There was no reason for it. The only thing I can think that that kept, that pulled him through was the love that he had for us. And that was a really hard thing for me to deal with. And I struggled with that for years, even into my adulthood, knowing that if it hadn't been for my papa's knowledge and how humble of a man he was, I would have never went back. And, it's hard for me to say because he fought for my for my life four times. Four times he threw himself in front of a, a, virtually a, a a train. Like there was no reason at all that that he should have came out on the other side, but he did, and he actually went on to live a a pretty happy and healthy healthy life after that, you know. He he lived a long life, and we were best friends from that point on. If I ever went up there to my mamma's and papa's house, even after he got too old to hunt, like he he went back and coon hunting and stuff after that. After he got doctored up and healed up and went through recovery, he'd go back out coon hunting again. He hunted until he couldn't hunt more. Once he got so old and stuff, he uh, I go up there to the farm and unhook him from his. From chain, he'd follow me around everywhere I went. You know, we were best friends to the day he died, and we had a special connection. And anytime I ever go up to the farm now, there's a holler that that runs down our property that that uh, whenever old Jake finally died, we buried him in. And I call it old Jake holler. And every single time I ever go up there, I always look over and remember what he done for me. I'll never forget. Not at that point in my life, if it if it hadn't been for him, I don't know what would have happened that night. I, I don't. That is, that's a tough pill to swallow. You know, I mean, being in your shoes and going through what you went through that night, uh, and then the aftermath, the the emotion afterwards of knowing how Jake survived, but knowing that if your grandfather wasn't there, you might not have had the, the life experience to think, to even go back to look for Jake the next day. Um, I can understand why that hits you so hard, you know? Oh yeah. I mean, it's just, and that's the experience in itself was traumatic and has, has shaped my life in a way that not many people's lives has probably been shaped in. But 
after, but what for years after that I suffered as a, I ended up self-medicating with, uh, with alcohol. And, uh, the reason why I done that was not because the experience in itself, because that experience in itself was, was horrible, but knowing that something loved me so much that it threw, threw itself, sacrificed itself over and over and over again for my protection out of love that I was, didn't have that life experience and would have just left him because I was so broken, but I wasn't ready for that in my, in my life. I wasn't, I mean, I, who would have been, there's not a person that's listening to this right now that if they were in my shoes would have known what to do at that young, that early in life. You know, I'd hunted and fished and stuff in them hills, these mountains around here, my life, my whole entire life go out by myself and play them you know, even as a kid and stuff. And, you know, you don't expect to see what isn't supposed to be real. You know, I never knew that these things existed. So, I mean, how, how were you supposed to deal with it? Right. Now, I I know we're going to get into more conversation about, you know, this experience and you know you i know you've seen the dog man again since then and your family's experiences and all that stuff but um uh, i wanted to ask you do you and I, I know this is this is this question you you don't have much of an answer for but more of just maybe a thought and opinion but do you have any do you wonder why your grandfather never warned you about the dog man being out there I mean, because he said, he told you on the way back, he said, you know, you got to understand that there's things out here you're not going to understand. You need to come to grips with that if you're going to be out here hunting. Um, did you ever wonder why you didn't get that heads up beforehand? As in, like, did he maybe hope that you just never came across it? Or it's something that you have to experience for yourself in order to even believe? I'd say a little bit of, of both, you know, that there's a chance that I might not have ever came across of it. And, uh, that, you know, one person could have an experience and if, if you don't experience for that for yourself, or you may not ever experience it, then how are you supposed to explain that to someone? You know, and being that he was a tough love type of guy, I mean, he's a very loving person, but he was smart and had a lot of, a lot of knowledge and, and a super humble person. Had a lot, a lot of uh, country know-how that that got him through, and if it wasn't for his experiences in life, then he wouldn't have ended up being the person he is, you know. And ultimately, now I can say that I'm a good person, but it took me a lot of experiences along the way to become the person I am. Yeah, man, I I can only imagine going through what you went through and how I would react to that. Uh, hunting would be off the the list for me for sure and uh I, i'm absolutely stunned that jake actually was able to go back out hunting did he ever show signs that he was hesitant to even go back out there no he didn't <clears throat> and it's because it was that was his love you know he he loved to hunt and he uh he hunted up until he couldn't no more you know up until Arthritis set in on him and stuff, and he wasn't able to get around. And, you know, that, that was his love and his passion, love to go out because, you know, these things, they are animals. They are creatures. They're not supernatural. They bleed just like anything else. And for all I know, he, he may have come across them at some other point, you know, and, and it's dogs hold on trauma different than what people do. And I've raised and, and bred and sold dogs and stuff my entire life. I've trained them. And every dog's different, just like people. You know, they all have personalities just like people. And it didn't affect him, you know, as far as going back out and going hunting and stuff. Yeah, he didn't get around as good as he did before. But the love for the hunt never left that dog until he died. 
Yeah, I I know you mentioned about how uh, Jake was, and I'm not sure if you actually mentioned it on here, but I know in one of our previous conversations, uh, you mentioned about how Jake was kind of legendary in that area. Like everybody knew about Jake. Uh, Did he ever kind of return to that kind of form or was he more of a, I don't know, a normal dog, (laughs) you know, where it's just like, ah, he's a hunting dog. He's not the superhuman or super dog hunting dog anymore. Uh, his uh his status went to just um a normal hunting dog like all the coon hunters in the community and stuff they knew him and knew he was an excellent dog and a great track dog and a meat dog like whenever he whenever he barked whenever he opened up you can you can take that check to the bank and cash it because he was after a coon you know but we also at that point after all that stuff happened we stopped taking them out with uh, other friends and and family that would that would come around and, and want to go out hunting and and bring a dog of their own. We just he'd already been through so much that we didn't want to take the chance on bringing other dogs around and uh, and possibly you know because you know dogs are just like people and sometimes uh, hounds can have. Uh, disagreements with each other uh especially hunting because there's so much adrenaline and everything that goes into it even for them that you know fights break out amongst dogs while they're hunting and uh we just we we never would risk it anymore after that by bringing a friend along with them that that might have a pup that that uh that needs to see some raccoons we just we just didn't do it it was just whenever we'd go out we would just take him out after that and hunting by self. I got you. Yeah, it makes sense. And, you know, earlier you were talking about early in the story about how oh, the uh, the dogs barking and, and you could tell what was going on by their barking. Um, is that something that, that you, you as a hunter pick up just knowing your dogs or is there like a very specific kind of bark that happens with these hounds and stuff that, you know, signal what they're hunting. I mean, I, I, it's just, I've never been around hunting dogs, let alone out, out in the, out in the woods hunting with a dog to know the differences in barks. Because like, uh, at one point you even said that the barks had, uh, had changed and it sounded like the fight changed for the better for you guys. And you, you, you thought that, uh, Bo had come back and I'm assuming looking back at it, I mean, it sounds like maybe it, obviously it wasn't Bo that came back to help that fight, but maybe the dog man came in and kind of just busted up the whole fight whether Jake was there or not. Yeah. Um, dogs have specific type of barks. Um, whenever, a whenever a hound is tracking a raccoon, they'll do what's called a ball bark where it's a, a longer drawn out bark. Um, and then once they find where the raccoon is at, then they, they do what's called a locating bark, which is more like a wolf howl, like a small version of a wolf howl that's long and drawn out, drawn out. But it's it's like a miniature version of of a wolf howl, uh, which you know they'll they'll bark one long strain that's anywhere from three to ten seconds nonstop, and then it goes into what's called a chop, where it's like constant quick barks. That's what's called a chop, and that's whenever they're they're looking up the tree because they're looking up towards the last place that they smelled the scent of the raccoon, and that's called a chop when they're looking up and barking like that because it's constant, kind of like your like your little yipping house dogs that you hear people that's just going yep 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 yep. That's that's what's called a chop. So it's a ball on the ground whenever the raccoon is on the ground. It's called a ball because they're longer than chops, but they're shorter than locates. And the once you hear these dogs and you get used to their personalities and everything, like I could, we could tell whenever the raccoon had uh, had tricked old Jake because he would let off what's called a triple triple bark, where he would go yep 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 yep, then he then there'd be a pause and then he'd go right back into it yep 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 yep. And then there'd be a pause because he knew it was there, but didn't know the exact location. So he was signaling, signaling back to us through his barks 
hey, it's around here. I haven't found it yet. I'm not sure. Because, you know, a raccoon, you know, they're, they can trick dogs and get away from them. They'll, they'll mark a tree. Like sometimes a raccoon will go up and they'll climb up halfway up on a tree and then they'll walk 10, 15, 20 yards and they'll climb up a couple different trees and they'll mark them because they can't decide which tree they want to go up which which way they, they feel safest and sometimes if a, if a dog's not that great of a dog they'll get tricked by that and the rat, then the the dog will bark up a tree that doesn't have anything in it because the raccoon has tricked the dog and earlier whenever we were talking about the uh the fight and how the there's different changes in the dynamics i've came to this conclusion that Jake and Bo were trailing this raccoon. And they trailed this raccoon to the tree that they were at, got treed, and they were barking, letting us know, hey, we found it. They were after the raccoon. And that pack of coyotes heard Jake and Bo barking, and that triggered in their head, hey, there's a meal ticket over here. There's animals in the woods that's letting us know exactly where they're at. We're going to go over here and, and try to get a meal. We're going to try to eat these dogs because coyotes, they will eat dogs. And so that's what they done. And then in between when those fights broke out to when the dog man showed up, because if the dog man would have showed up at the same exact time that the coyotes were there, the whole fight would have been bad. It would have been straight death for our dogs that night. So what I think happened is that from the smell of its breath, I know that the dog man is a creature of opportunity. You know, it'll eat both living and dead creatures from the smell of its breath. Because as I said, it smells like the puke from a vulture or a buzzard. And they're the only breath, I mean, uh, like a buzzard truce, that's the only smell in the world, in the entire planet, that smells like that, that I've, I've came across in the woods. That's the only, like, rot, rot is different. I've smelled decaying animals and stuff like that. But the puke that a buzzard releases has its own smell. It's in its own category of stink. There's nothing else that smells like it. Nothing. And so it took it took its opportunity. It heard a fight broke it, breaking out in the woods and it headed in the direction of our dogs and those coyotes and showed up. And luckily if if the dog man would not have grabbed a hold of the coyotes and would have grabbed a hold of old Jake at the very beginning, this story would be completely different. You know, he probably would have killed him and Bo as well. And you, but I mean, honestly, I mean, if that, if it happened like that, I mean, we're talking about you coming up to a scene where a dog man had just killed your dogs and you have no dogs to defend you like you did. I mean, yeah. you may yeah. not even be here to tell that story. Yeah, that's true, too. You know, that's also true. Yeah, I didn't even think about it like that. It's unbelievable. And uh, also, uh, side note, um, Bo was found as well. It was a couple weeks later. We got a, uh, a call from a, a local market that's... Uh, as you go into the Daniel Boone, there's one store there, an old country store. It's shut down now, but uh, all of our dogs always had nameplates on them. A couple weeks later, we got a call from the market, and me and my papa, my grandfather, we uh, we drove over there and picked him up. And uh, he uh, he was missing, like I said, for two weeks, and he had some little cuts on him and stuff where the coyotes grabbed a hold of him, but they wasn't bad. They'd already heal, started to heal up around that time. And he was in poor, he had poor weight. You know, he'd lost quite a bit of weight from being gone for two weeks, but he was in relatively good health for 
as much as he went through, which was nowhere near the same amount as what what uh, old Jake had to endure. Yeah, I, I I can imagine his wounds were a lot different than than Jake's for sure. Uh, I found it interesting, and in, uh, with our previous conversations, I just have a hard time remembering what you said here and what you said to me in one of our other phone calls. But uh, you mentioned about how the dogs learn to hunt. Actually, I think you did talk about it in the beginning. I found that really interesting because I, I never knew how how you train a dog to to do those kind of things. And it makes sense. Like if you have dogs around that are used to hunting, you, you do some training with the with the pup, but eventually they go out and they learn from the other dogs by what they do. Yeah, I mean that's the same thing with like people who have sled dogs and stuff. They learn from from uh running with the with the pack as far as that goes and uh they I mean, you, you can train a dog by itself with like a or like a raccoon hide or whatever, whatever type of um, small game that that you're looking for. You can do it like that, but it, it just it takes a lot longer. So, you know, if if they have if the dogs it has some intelligence about it, because not every hound makes a hunting dog, and the the saying uh, you can't can't teach an old dog a new trick that actually comes from houndsmen because if you have a dog that's three or four years old that's a hound um, and you try to train it to to hunt then they're most of the time the majority of the time you're not going to have success although sometimes it has happened you know there are, there are people who who make a dog that's never hunted into a hound you know but i mean there's a lot of discipline and stuff that they have to learn that they can only learn by running with an old dog whenever i say discipline i'm not saying like like i said we trained every dog with love we never did beat on them or, or nothing like that we scolded them sometimes but you know they have to they have to learn that hey if i grab a hold of a skunk it's gonna spray me and i'm gonna get sick <laughs> and so you know there's a lot of things that that uh they have to learn without a human actually being there and they pick it up from running with the old dogs and uh, they pick up what these old dogs are doing to get the success. They fall in love with tracking the raccoons and they, they, they figure out, Hey, this is what this other dog I'm running with is doing to, to get, to get the reward. And so they start doing it eventually. It takes, it takes time, but after a while they get the hang of it. Yeah. I find it really interesting. Uh, I find all this really interesting. Uh, with with the dog man that you saw that night, uh, you described the hands and how they're almost like human hands with claws. You mentioned about how there was the 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 chest was like a like a human chest, and you mentioned about obviously the facial features. But I was wondering, with my mental image here. It would it be too far to, of a stretch to say that the feet were more human like, or did they look more dog like, or did you not really get a good now, look? Now, on on my first encounter, I never got to see the feet or the legs very well because I'm point blank with it, looking at all the the scary features. So on the first one, I did not get to see the bottom portion of its body, and I don't know if it was a a male or female, you know, I know that when I say it has the chest of a man, uh, an abdomen of a man, you know, it's, it's, it's hairy, but it, it's more, it's more like built like a, like a man's chest is, you know, um, and it has a really narrow waist. It doesn't have a real broad waist. It's waist is narrow. You know, that's the most narrow part of it. And the head's proportionate to the body. It doesn't have an oversized head or a smaller head or anything like that, it has a proportionate head to the body size. And the ears on it kind of look like that of like a German police or a gray wolf, uh, but are more, they stick more to the side of its head, like, like a kind of like a, a lynx or a bobcat, wildcat, you know, more like that, but you know, like like a dog, you know, like a a dog's version of that, I guess you could say. 
it doesn't it didn't have any like tufts of hair or anything coming out of its ears like, like a bobcat would per se but i mean it just does stick to the side of its head a little bit more and it didn't have its its ears tilted back towards me the whole entire time its ears were pointed up you know it didn't move its ears around and uh, i can say that as far as description goes on the first one that um the the throat the back throat like when its mouth was was fully opened and i could see it in into the throat it has a really big throat hole that's that's bigger than a canine you know like because what it was doing in the in the first attack on on the coyote it there, it wasn't a normal amount of blood that you would see from like an animal fight or an animal attack. Even the amount of blood that that dog man had on it was, it was essentially eating that coyote alive while it was attacking it. It was just covered in blood, like it it couldn't wait to. Ki- Kill the coyote before it started eating. It was eating on that coyote while it was killing it. And I can say from the teeth, I, I can't say 100% sure if it has more teeth than what a canine would have or less gaps between each tooth. Because its mouth, its mouth looks like look like it was just filled with teeth, but because it's dark and there's all this adrenaline going, and I have a, I had a really really bright flashlight. Like I said, this light's a high powered flashlight, like a spotlight that you would use on a boat looking for buoys or something. Like it's a really bright, and it lit up the whole entire forest. So as I'm looking forward and looking back, I'm I'm seeing everything pretty clear. And the mouth and the teeth, I couldn't tell, like I said, if it had more teeth or less space. I couldn't determine that. And uh, I can say that uh, the muzzle on this dog man is stuck out from its face about eight inches away from its face. You know, that's give or take. It might have been more than that. And actually... The uh, the lips, uh, its actual mouth. This is unlike a canine. That on a canine, the mouth ends at the back of the muzzle, as as the uh, as the corners of its mouth touch the back of its 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 muzzle towards the face. Is where a canine's mouth ends, but on the dog man, it's not like that. On the dog man. Its uh, its mouth actually goes up on a little bit, uh, probably a couple of inches on each side of of the face. So its mouth is actually bigger than that of a canine. And so, whenever its mouth is opened about a quarter way, like not all the way, because in the first encounter, it's snapping its jaws and and spitting that blood and snot and everything else on me i'm seeing its face i mean i'm looking right at it because that's the scariest part of it i'm looking right at it because it's right in my face and its jaws like i said or its lips go up on the side of its head a little bit so whenever it's it's open about about a quarter of the way not not fully opened when its mouth is open about a quarter of the way it almost looks like and you could swear by it that it's smiling at you, but it's not smiling. In no way, shape, or form is it is it is it an emotional discharge from the, from the face. It's not a smile. It's not some sort of happiness or a, a sense of malice or anything like that. That's just how it's made. That's the creature's makeup. You know, it's not. There's no emotion. In in its mouth when it's open a quarter of the way, there's no smile. It looks like a smile, and you would think that it is a smile, but it's not. That's just how it's made. 
It's interesting you say that because I've had uh, conversations with people that describe creatures with similar characteristics. And the very first time I came across this was a guy who had gotten lost in the Smoky Mountains. I I think it was like episode 84 or 85 that I did way back in the day. And um, he got lost out there and he was describing this face that he saw. Uh, It's been so long that I'm pretty sure he talked about it, like seeing this face like appear like out, out of the bushes or something like that. It wasn't like a full body thing. But one of the things that always stuck in my head was that he called it a smile. He said it, it had this smile on its face. It was just like, it went almost like it went from ear to ear. And uh, and then I had uh, another guy on, and one of the characteristics of this guy that, that described that was he said whatever he was looking at had almost like what he called raccoon eyes. It had like these dark black spots around its eyes. And, um, and then not too long ago, just just a couple of weeks ago, I, I interviewed a guy who was in the Smoky Mountains at the exact location that that experience happened. Like he said, when he listened to that episode, he knew exactly where the guy was at because the, the guy went into such great detail. He he knew the area. He knew exactly what he was talking about. And this guy actually had uh, had some GoPros on him. And when he was looking back through his footage, there looks like something peeking around a tree at him and you see two eyes with that looked like raccoon eyes looking at him and uh it, it just it was striking resemblance I, I, I have the picture I, I looked at it it's, it's not something you have to squint real hard to see and uh so the fact that both those guys had some kind of an experience with something that had those dark circles around the eye the first guy says it looked like it was smiling at him. Well, the Smoky Mountains aren't that far from Daniel Boone. And I just wonder, I wonder if what they experienced was a dog man of some kind. I mean, the picture that I saw, it it really, it does, like, I wouldn't say that was a dog man if I was just looking at it. It wouldn't strike me like that. I've, ne- I've never seen a dog man in person, but it's just not what I would have imagined as a dog man. So I don't know if it's two different things or what, but just the smile that you described kind of sticks out to me, especially since Daniel Boone and the Smokies, you know, in the grand scheme of geography, they're not that far apart. Yeah, they're not. And, uh, like if anyone that you can get on or talk to that has been, <clears throat> that has been point blank with them. And I know without a shadow of a doubt, that I'm not the only one that's been that close to them. I know I'm not. There's too many people in the world that can be that has been that close to a dog man. I can't say about other cryptids, but that has been that close to a dog man can tell you that that it's their their mouth goes up on the side of their face is is essentially what it is. And once it's open, it's just the way it's made. You know the way the creature's made. And uh, I do feel like that it is part of the canine family, that it does have some some DNA of the canine in its, in its ancestry somewhere. And I know that it's, it's not a paranormal creature. It's, it's flesh and blood, just like anything else. Maybe it just, maybe you just don't see as many of them out there because maybe it's like an elephant, you know, that they have. They hold their babies a long time before they have them out. And for all I know, then, you know, they might not have a full litter of, of pups. You know, for all I know, I'm not, I'm saying pups, but I don't, I'm not really sure. And um, even the uh, the actions that, that the uh, animal took, because I, I, I've raised and sold and trained hounds my entire lives and canines. I've worked with them. I've seen them. I've seen the actions that they have, that they that they have. When I say actions, I'm saying the very first dog man that I encountered had a dominant stance. When I say dominant stance with canines, whenever there's a canine that's establishing dominance or that is mad and upset and means to to cause harm or to stand its ground, when they breathe. And they're in this dominant stance. They breathe from their chest. And anyone that's ever been around dogs can can attest to this. 
that they breathe from the chest whenever they're mad or upset or they're they're wanting to stand their ground and let you know, hey, don't mess with me or I'm pissed off and I'm coming at you. They breathe from their chest. And a, and a dog or canine that's, uh, I guess you'd say canid, not canine, because, I mean, it'd be a member of the canid family, uh, would be that one that's calm would t- take a breath from from its belly you know like you see a dog that's playing or relaxing and you see it breathing then it's breathing from its belly it's in it's in a, a relaxed state and they have a lot of similarities between how how a pissed off canine or canid would look compared to the dog man in a pissed off state and honestly i believe to this day that the reason why the dog man chased after me in the first place was the same exact reason why a dog that's that's uh hasn't ate for a while or that's really protective of his food you pour a dog uh, uh, it's it's dog feed out in a bowl there's a good chance that it might if you've been down the pit it, it might bite its owner not every dog uh, that's why it's important if you have a, a dog from a pup whenever you feed it you always pet it that way if you have some kids or something go around your dog then it, it's used to getting petted and loved on while it's eating but it's it's a dangerous thing to do if you have one that's been loved on or that has never been loved on while while it's uh it's it's eating its meal and I came in on it essentially while it was having its lunch, you know, while it was having its dinner, its midnight snack, whatever you'd want to say. And I was in in its territory and I was too close for comfort and it felt threatened. And that's why it took off after me. And then once it took off after me and I continued to run and then it became predator versus prey because I was running away. And if I was faced in that same exact situation to this day, would would I react differently or would I kill it if I had a big enough firearm? Absolutely, 100% if I was faced with the same exact situation. But most hunters, almost all hunters, and I know that I am this way, I'm a conservationist before I am a hunter, meaning – that I love wildlife. I want to see it to continue to grow. I don't want all the deer and all the turkey and all the bobcats and all the elk and all all this all these different creatures. I don't want them all killed. You know, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna hang uh, 10, 20 deer heads on my wall. I'm not that guy. You know, I, I'm not. And so, with that being said. I don't want all of them killed and hunted and tracked down and annihilated off the face of the earth. That's not what I want because they're cre- they're part of the habitat habitat and and environment in the Daniel Boone just like any other creature. I honestly feel that wholeheartedly, and I don't want them all killed. But even though that traumatic event I went through, a lot of people would say, "Yeah, kill them all." I'm not that guy. You know, because the second one that I seen in my second encounter never caused me any harm. And I seen it pretty close, nowhere near as close as I did in my first encounter, but close enough to where it was uncomfortable, but it never caused me any harm. Yeah. And I I can understand that, that mindset and stuff. I've talked to plenty of hunters and that's a very common mindset And, and it makes sense. I mean you should be a conservationist. I mean, especially as hunters who, you know, are out there living off land for food and things like that. You don't, you're not there to abuse the habitat. You thrive off the habitat. You live off of it. So uh, you're there to, you know, take what you need and, and not go crazy. Um, I'll tell you what, we're, we're coming up on an hour and a half here on this first segment. So uh, let's, 
Let's take a quick break and then we're going to open it up here again for the overtime segment and we're going to get into more stuff here. I mean, we have so much to talk about. Uh, we're going to talk about your second encounter here. Uh, we're going to talk about your dad's experience, your grandpa's experience, slew foot and what all that entails. And just there, there's so many different things we're going to go into. Even the idea that you you never even knew of these things as quote unquote cryptids. It was just something that was part of your your life growing up. And uh, I think it's a really interesting conversation. I want to say thank you very much for joining us on this first segment. And uh, members, if you want, go ahead and log in because the second hour or who knows how long we're going to go on this overtime segment, it's there right now waiting for you. So uh, I'll tell you what, Kyle, thank you very much for joining me here on the first segment. Yeah, I am. Well, that's the show, everybody. I really hope you enjoyed it. If you did enjoy it, please share this show everywhere on the internet. Text it to everybody. You all have cell phones. You text people every day. Take the link to this show and text it to people right now. If you want the YouTube link, it's available on YouTube right now. So go to YouTube, hit the subscribe button for the confessionals, take the video and share it with everybody. But make sure you hit the subscribe button because once we hit that 25,000 mark, I am releasing this first of many journeys I'm about to go on for Chase legends. It's going to be awesome. I promise you, but we're not going to release anything until we hit 25,000 subscribers. So go ahead and subscribe to the confessionals on YouTube right now. And if you're a member, go ahead to the website right now in the overtime section. There is a whole other hour and a half of this conversation with Kyle waiting for your listening pleasure. And then on Thursday, we're going to be talking to Kyle again about strange Kentucky and all the weirdness that happens in Kentucky. And until next week, friends, stay safe, take care, and remember, the truth will set you free. But first, it'll piss you off. Hey, thanks for watching The Confessionals on YouTube. If you like what you heard, hit the subscribe button, hit the share button, and hit the like button. That would be a great help to me. And if you want more of The Confessionals on a weekly basis, every Thursday, I come out with a special show just for members on my website. So if you want to check that out, go to theconfessionalspodcast.com, hit the join button, and become a member today. And every Thursday, you'll get a new show, and you can binge on previous shows, which there's almost a 100 of them. So if you love the show, go ahead and check it out. But thank you very much for being here on YouTube and checking out the channel.